So you started this about five, roughly a little more than five years ago, and then um, we devoted this many years to build uh, something that is quite useful for the industry. And, um, and then now we're sort of at a natural juncture where we can actually reflect on what we have done so far and then what it means and, and then try to make observations out of that. So clearly, programmable switch chips can have the same power and performance and cost as fixed function switches. We delivered them. And then uh, on top of this programmability without compromise, people can now realize their beautiful ideas. Um, and, and those ideas are not just necessarily you know, deriving from the chip designers. These can be done by the OEMs or your vendors, sometimes by the hyperscalers and large online service providers themselves. And this means that we'll keep having more innovations going forward, right? So that's the high-level summary of my talk. But before moving forward, we need to confirm one thing, right? Where is the evidence that these programmable chips are really running without penalty? Right? So I just wanted to um, get some numbers, not produced by us, but produced by our partners. So um, this is the number that we collected from one of our OEM partners, uh, their public websites. So here is the number for the Topino-based switches, uh, and here is the number for fixed function chip-based switch. And um, roughly, by the way, these two chips are built with exactly the same process, not you know, no technology. So it's fair comparison. And the speed, the total speed is roughly, roughly the same, but Tokino offers more profile. But let's look at a few rows here. Tokino offers 4.8 billion packets a second, the other one offers about 4.2. Tokino is somewhat better. Another thing, uh, power consumption per port. Tokino is again slightly better than the other one. And then the latency. Tokino can be programmed to be a little lower than this. If you put a lot more complexity, the Pino can offer maybe a few more hundred uh, nanoseconds, but still, you know, if you're optimizing to Pino for latency, you can go as low as this number. So this really confirms that, hey, there is no penalty for programmability, right? Yes. So just, just because yep. it's one of my hobbies, I'm curious, how are you guys actually getting, how are you guys defining getting full entropy on, on your chip? Full entropy, which one are you talking Laggy about? Laggy CMP hash algorithm. I mean, yep. getting full entropy out of a chip is not an easy task, and I'm just sort of curious how you're coming up with that. Uh, I, well, I mean, the beauty of it is programmable. You can ultimately come up with the, the algorithm that actually allows you to extract the full entropy out of whatever, you know, wherever the differentiation in the packet is, and that's really one of the more unique uh, aspects it allows you to get you know full load distribution in the network where some people are limited to only using seeds that probably don't you know fully bring out the yeah. entropy from that so well, I it's, it's, a, it's a conversation like, we can like electrical impulses to yeah. generate your entropy or what you're, and, no I mean it's, we're still yeah. using packet data but we can follow up offline to some of yeah, the, that's fine. The, the some of the the specific examples but it's something that some people really care care about a lot yeah. I'm sure it sounds like you're aware yeah want to get really nerdy. There's always somebody is what he's trying to say. <laughs> okay. This isn't already really nerdy? Well, I just got another level. <laughs> um, so if you look at the history of computing, this has happened many times. So graphics, it started with fixed function chips, but about two decades ago, NVIDIA came out with this programmable GPUs. It's programmable in high-level language called OpenCL, and then the compiler is responsible for lowering that user idea, high-level user idea, into the real realizations. When they did that, um, of course, they were initially focusing on this graphics-related application acceleration. Then people usually or gradually realized, oh, this high-level programmability, and then the target, which is merchant, I can do more things than just original things that they envision, including virtual reality, augmented reality. And then at this point, GPUs are used for a lot of other things, like machine learning, cryptocurrency, and all those things. If you went back two decades ago and then asked their CTO whether they would have imagined these kind of things, they would have said, no. They didn't even know that they would happen, right? 
but now it's ha it has happened. We believe that something similar to that kind of explosion can happen with this programmable merchant silicon. Obviously, we're targeting L2, L3 switching and some enterprise switching and better telemetry kind of features. People are gradually realizing that, oh, I can build very fast, very cost efficient middle boxes and application gateways and so on. And then we'll see more and more innovations beyond just regular networking. Some combinations for you know storage and compute acceleration or interconnect for accelerator uh, kind of workloads. Okay. So I wanted to share some examples of those. And then the first example is this layer for connection load balancer. Um, what is layer for load balancer? It receives traffic from the internet or outside the world destined to load balanced addresses, also known as virtual IP addresses here. And then uh, each virtual IP address is handled by a number of physical servers, each of which owns a deep, okay, direct IP address. And then um, essentially load balancer maintains this VIP to deep pool mappings. And then for each new connection, it chooses one of the deeps in the pool, and then it consistently forward packets to that chosen deep. And of course, this deep pool can change frequently because you do scale up or scale out or scale down <coughs> or maintenance and those things. Right. So um, people have now realized that they can actually build layer four load balancer, very fast layer four load balancer using Tofino. And then it complements the state of art, which is scaled out software based load balancer. Right. Um, then they can either build a layer for load balancing appliances and then deploy them in addition to software load balancers, or they sometimes fold this layer for load balancing functions into their existing switches, typically top of rack switches. And then the benefits are obvious. First of all, Topino can handle five billion, roughly five billion packets a second with guaranteed sub microsecond latency. And then if it cannot handle that many you know, complicated things, at the compile time, it will fail. But once it compiles, it guarantees full line rate, maximum latency, power consumption, done. So how, how, how nice is that, right? So that saves a lot of cost, especially if you're burning many software-based load balancers in your environment. It offers predictable and high performance. And because of this, it's also quite useful uh, to ensure robustness against attacks. And then remember, load balancers are usually the first tier which actually receives untrusted external traffic. So this you know, robustness against availability attack is usually very important. Um, when you build you know, layer for load balancer, uh, simple hashing just doesn't work. The, the reason is this. Um, suppose you had, say, four dips, four servers in your deep pool, then you were doing some simple stateless hashing. So some connections were mapped here. Now, deep two has been brought down for maintenance or for failure or whatever reason. You could have assigned this deep two space to a new or another deep, say deep three. Then this is not a load balancer anymore because the space is not you know, fairly you know, divided. Or you could have rebalanced this in a fair fashion but then what happens is something like this connection I, right? Which was previously mapped to deep three, now it's mapped to deep four, even when deep three was alive. So you're breaking this connection, right? So it's a connection breaker. So that's why you have to do this on a connection basis, and then you have to create per connection state, and also <coughs> ensure uh, connection per connection consistency, right? So doing this requires some careful engineering in the data plane, and then we have actually demonstrated built some prototype, and some of our customers actually took that idea and then built their own load balancers. When you do this per connection consistency, as I said, you have to, work, you have to ensure some scalability because you're creating per connection state entry in the data plane. So it's important to be able to ensure a large scale. And also when you burn your you know, precious SRAM to maintain this kind of connection state, it's important not to waste that space for useless connections, like attack connections. So it's important to build these kind of features in the, in the device too. So we have prototyped two ideas. The first one is uh, what we call cache mode. It's essentially an accelerator or almost transparent accelerator that sits in front of or on top of existing software load balancer. And then as you can see, the data plane has one simple connection table and then when, when it 
When the incoming packet doesn't match here, it just simply redirects that packet to the software load balancer, which can run the switch control plane or maybe another server. And then, uh, and then the, 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 the software load balancer maintains this connection table. Okay. So this is actually the, dom the most dominant way of using this uh, solution, layer for load balancer. And then many of our uh, hyperscaler customers in, uh, in the cloud business have built their own load balancers this way, taking advantage of their existing software load balancers. So this has been in their production for more than a year now. Um, we have also built more elaborate and more powerful uh, load balancer, which basically takes care of the connection uh, selection, even for the first packet of a new connection in the data plane. And then control plane only manages the learning process. This is also what we have demoed about two years ago and then uh, showcased. The next interesting example is uh, HPCC, standing for High Performance Congestion Control. This is actually not what we did. This is what our, one of our customers did, Alibaba. And then they actually showcased this at a top tier conference called CCOM a couple months ago. And um, essentially, they used the INT, Data Plane Telemetry feature, to do a very fast and precise uh, congestion control between the switches and their end host, right? So congestion control is always closed feedback loop between where congestion happens, basically switches, and where you can actually throttle the traffic, meaning your end host, right? Um, what they did is something like this. They basically used uh, our, you know, Topino switches, which actually add INT information to every packet, and then this INT information is now piggybacked into the TCP or RDMA congestion control protocols act packet. And then the end host or their smart NIC built with uh, FPJ actually use this information to adjust rate um, precisely. One very important thing is that because this information, link utilization and queue statistics are so precise and timely and accurate, they could actually do what is called uh, almost unthinkable so far, which is MIMD, multiplicative increase and multiplicative decrease. So TCP variants all have used like additive increase. They are very conservative when, incre when they increase the rate. And then when they face congestion, they do multiplicative decrease because they have to back up very quickly. This is good for fairness and congestion <coughs> control, but it's slow. The reason they had to be slow is because the congestion information is just one bit, ECN bit, or just packet drop. Very, very you know, opaque information. Now, with INT, they can actually do aggressive increase. So they actually handle congestion very fast, and yet it's still you know, stable, and it converges very quickly. So the summary of that, they, this is actually the, the chart that we copied from their papers, not ours. When in-cast or sudden congestion happens, the, the latency of HPCC is less than 10 microseconds, even when you have three hops, right? And then DCQCN is the state-of-art RDMA-based congestion control, which is widely used in you know, large data centers such as Microsoft and so on. This is what is actually shipped in today's NICs, smart NICs, like Mellanox NICs and our you know, Intel NICs. They can do, at best, this kind of congestion control. HPCC reduces this down way further. And then compared to the other you know, popular congestion control protocols used in you know, Microsoft, Google, other places, HPCC outperforms all these things downright. Right? So that's the beauty of programmability given to the end users and powerful you know, end users. The last one. So um, accelerating training. So training is a big deal these days uh, with GPUs and TPUs and so on. One would think that the training is done just once and then you just keep reusing that algorithm model for inference. That's not true. Every single hour, minute, they actually rerun training because the goals change, the models change, and the input data keeps changing. So ex being able to learn or you know, run a lot of training jobs in parallel and very fast is very important for all these service providers. Interesting thing is that GPUs and TPUs are getting faster, a lot more po powerful over a you know, short period of time. And therefore, the total amount of time it takes to run, say, one you know, famous benchmark training set gets reduced over a few years. But 
this gap, which is basically networking overhead, doesn't go down. So CPUs or GPUs are just way faster, so you actually end up wasting most of your training time to do better communication. That's what we're observing, and then we're trying to address this problem here. So distributed deep neural networks, um, each worker, each GPU or TPU runs some models, and then it, they have to periodically exchange all these parameters, right? And so in the old days, actually, they, people introduced uh, this x86-based parameter servers, and then all the parameters were exchanged through this parameter server, and then people quickly realized that x86 is not a great I.O. machine. They cannot keep up with the rate of GPUs. So they switched it to more peer-to-peer -peer, you know, GPU or TPU-based models where a hyper-ring or hyper-cube is built, and then model exchange rate updates are done through this way, but it introduces latency because it always takes n square or log n steps, right? Now, what we're observing here is that, yes, this intensive all-to-all -all communication between the workers, especially when the number of workers is growing, is very heavy, and faster GPUs make this problem even more skewed, right? So only if we can accelerate this kind of parameter exchanges, it would be actually quite useful. So essentially, this is a cartoon visualizing what we have done using Topino, working as a very fast parameter server. Remember, Topino can handle 5 billion packets a second with guaranteed latency, processing latency. So that, that's like you know, 50 or almost 100 x86 servers I.O. capacity, right? So Topino reserves some space in its own SRAM, and then it admits some weight updates from one of the servers or workers. And then uh, it collects weight from the other worker, and then it folds. By folding, I mean that it just simply calculates addition and then generates the average. And then it sends out the results back, and then two more space are made available, so it can admit more weights, the next set of weights, and this continues. Right? So this is a simply very simple you know, uh, high-speed reduction mechanism that is done on Tofino. When you use this kind of parameter server, we measure the uh, actual time that it takes to run, uh, learn some models uh, with the same accuracy target, and then the performance gain is, sorry, about uh, somewhere between one and a half to three x. Okay, and then this is consistent across ten g network and hundred g network. So, as you can imagine. We're turning order of n square problem into order of n, or from each individual worker's point of view, it's constant because they send their own weight, and somehow magically they received <coughs> aggregated weight. So that means that our system actually scales linearly, whereas the existing systems, when they actually increase the number of workers in the system, the performance actually goes down. So what this means is that this is even more future proof. When you have to deal with even larger models, and hence when you need to introduce more workers, the benefit will be even more pronounced. Okay. So that's the summary. Uh, so this is my last slide. Now, we have programmable high-speed machines without penalty. Um, if you're an end user, sometimes you may want to do programming on your own. If you're hyperscalers, if you have your own development muscles. If you're not, you could just go to your favorite OEMs and then tell them that, hey, I need these kind of new features, right? So equipment vendors can, so far they couldn't send you just software upgrade. Now they can. New forwarding features take just weeks, maybe a quarter or two to develop by them. And then by then, uh, you know, you, you don't have to figure out the hack, right? Because you, you can cleanly solve your problems in your network, and uh, you, you don't need a complete uh, hardware upgrade at huge expense. You can keep reusing the same hardware and yet enjoy new features. So that, that concludes my talk. Any, so yeah. one of the things, you know, as I see all this, and, and, and again, I go back to, you know, it's cool to program my switch and, you know, you know, all the problems that can come with that. And looking at, like, the load balancing and the telemetry and the, you know, information and the tagging and the int and all, all the features to add on there, how many simultaneous either functions or commands could we look at for that? I mean, do you have to pick one feature or the other in doing this, or do I have a, you know, is it 
truly a program where I can give it a series of steps to go through? And I, I mean, how, how much flexibility really is there in this, or am I in a constrained space in trying to think of that? You know, you got you got one job, and are you going to do it this way or that way? Mm -hmm. uh, and which which way does this allow me to go? Well, the nice thing about programmability, you can choose the simplest way that you want to start with. For example, congestion control. No, I understand, to, but yeah. if I want to do load balancing and congestion control um, and telemetry, where, where's the limit? You know, it's kind of, it's kind of like, you know, we, we know all the vendors give me all these cool yes. features to do, yes. and you can say, you can do all this, just not at the same time. <laughs> so, so, I mean, in the first generation, there was a limit to that capacity. In Tofino 2, what we did was the Ultra Series, we added almost double, you know, the resources. So you can now do a lot more. Ultimately, you're always going to be limited by the amount of memory and engines, you know, on the device. But... Not necessarily do you have to be doing, you know, AI, co you know, computation as well as layer four load balancing as telemetry all at the same time. The one thing we want to prove out is you can do everything you can do today and typically that one additional thing that is important in that place in the network. But through the power of just loading a different program, you can repurpose that one, you know, top of rack to if it's if it's now used in an AI training cluster. You can have it do the machine learning example that Chang just talked about. If uh, it's in a load balancing cluster where you're doing scale out, I don't know, storage or whatever else, you can do that. So. Well, I, I can always envision customers who are going to be like, oh, yeah, but we need that and that and that and that. In, get that. in the same rack, you know. <laughs> in, the same <laughs> right. in, in the exact same switch, perhaps not, but yes. Okay.